happy for another opportunity to be with all of you. I'm certainly thankful for the visitors that we have, thank the presence of each one. Uh, in the lesson today, I'd like to uh, make an argument for the existence of our great God in heaven. It's something that uh, is constantly under attack, especially by, in our universities and our schools where people try to undermine the faith of our young people and uh, the minds of uh, all of the youth. And uh, there's much reason for one to believe in God. Of course, more reasons than we've got time for in this short period. But we'd like to look at some of the arguments about the existence of God that we can see in the book of nature uh, all around us. Uh, when we talk about science, it's been... Uh, uh, define different ways. It should be a, a search, uh, an investigation to find out the best answer for how things uh, work in the world that God has created around us, but there are a lot of false definitions that have entered into uh, science and into our schools today that we want to take a quick look at. Uh, belief in God and uh, in belief in the Bible was really the foundation for the modern scientific method that all of these great discoveries about the laws of nature flowed out of and we should uh, pay respect to that and remember that really rather than the Bible being unscientific or our religion being an enemy of science it's actually laid the foundation for all the discoveries that have come about. There are key presumptions that were made by early scientists that were believers in God that led to great discoveries that we want to look at and some evidence of intelligent design that we can see in creation, uh, irreducible complexity, the DNA code, the over-design that we see uh, in human beings, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll <laughs> I'll talk fast enough that we get, get through that. The uh, uh, idea of the rise and fall of theistic science, you know, all of these big universities around the country that are dedicated to uh, atheism and uh, humanism and the idea of uh, uh, materialism and you want to rule out all religion and all anything that's supernatural uh, in the in the universe and in the world around us uh, this is something that's only happened in the last 150 years or so uh, judo Christian origins of modern science is something that can easily be laid out about all the great founders of all the different fields of science uh, were believing uh, people that believed in God and His Word, and they believed nature was intelligible, and uh, it wasn't just filled with all kinds of random spirits or whatever, but there were laws of nature that they were able to find the blueprint that God uses to construct life. There was existing order in the universe that could be dis dis studied and understood, and a natural order that they saw all around them had to be created by an intelligent designer and creator. And so that was the presumption that built the whole scientific revolution. Uh, but uh, they recognized fallible human reason that you have to look and research. You can't just uh, deduce everything and find the truth, but you've got to see, see how it was all made. Uh, Occam's razor the, has the statement, never pose pluralities or many explanatory <laughs> entities without necessity. That you find the simple answer usually is the right answer that you find for the cause of things. And, of course, God is the, is the answer when it comes to creation. You, but this has been replaced by materialism, as I say, over the years back with uh, uh, a number of... Uh, different fields of uh, science. They came up with naturalistic uh, explanations for everything and tried to rule out the presence or necessity of God in creation. You know, you had Darwin and evolution and all of that come along and they took over the different universities of the land that were started, most of them, by religious people. And uh, they got tenure and then they denied tenure to those that believe in the Bible in, in their science departments. And over time, they've just taken over our institutions with materialism. That everything is either mass or energy. That there's uh, uh, everything is a result of time and chance. And when our young people go to the university, 
a lot of these people are bold uh, 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 in their atheism and want to spread that atheism to others and rule out anything that the Bible has to say. They have a new definition for science that they teach. It's not scientific, but if you have anything that has to do with God in it or intelligent design, then it can't be science. To be scientific in our era is to search for a solely natural explanation. You can see that's very limiting. That's the only kind of answer you can find and be counted as a scientist. You can't find the hand of God. You can't find uh, intelligent design in anything. It all has to be some natural process that resulted in the things that we see about us. I have a picture there on the screen of an apple. It's got some teeth marks on it, but somebody bit that apple. Um, let's suppose if you limited the research the way these atheistic scientists do, and you say, now you can find, uh, you got to find the explanation for what happened to that apple, but you can't say a human had anything to do with it. No, that's what they do. God can't have anything to do with it. So what's your solution going to be? Well, you go out and you get to examining that apple in the yard and the person that owned it and all this man, and you maybe test the DNA that's there on those bite marks, and you find out, well, they match the guy that lives there at the house, right? And you do all of this research, but you can't come to the right conclusion because you've ruled out the one answer you can't give. It's just a human being that bit that apple. So you've got to find maybe some other trace element there somewhere that an animal bit that apple or whatever. You're, you're limited in your conclusion. That's exactly what they teach our young people at, at these universities. You can't, you can't be scientific. You can't have the right explanation if you say God did it. You got to rule that out. Well, the science used to be you just f find the best explanation. That's what you look for. But they've rigged the system. A lot of times they give you the talk when you go off to college. This scientist at the University of Washington, he talks to all of the new students that come in and he tells them science has rendered belief in God implausible. So you're an idiot if you believe in God. So just right off the bat, you students recognize that about the way things are in science department. Uh, he says, as evolutionary science has progressed, the available, available space for religious belief has narrowed. Not much room for religion anymore. That's their preconceived attitude and what they want to push on our kids. It has demolished belief in an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God. Well, that idea there's a kind God that loves you out there He's got all power. We, we rule that out now with our theories. That's all gone. So put that out of your head. A couple of these guys, Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Crass, they've written books in recent years, and they put religion and science in conflict with one another as incompatible. Science undermines the credibility of belief in God. I saw a video this morning before I left to come down here with Richard Dawkins being asked by a student, well, why don't you ever debate the creationists? Why don't you take on the strongest arguments? Oh, well, I just don't, I don't, I don't debate creationists. I don't have time for that. It's because they pinned his ears back whenever he tried it, right? They won't, they, you know, I'll, I'll, some bishop that really doesn't have much faith in the Bible to begin with, he'll debate him. But somebody that can actually, as a scientist, debate him on creation terms, he won't do it. And over and over again, you can see these debates online, and when they do venture to debate, they lose. But they've got control of the institutions and the narrative, and they won't let the other side speak. Well, we have opportunity to speak today and to look at what the Bible has to teach. Science and religion, they say, is in conflict. Science undermines the credibility of belief in God. There's an inherent conflict between the evidence we have about the natural world as reported by scientists and the belief in deity. That wasn't the view until the 19th uh, century when they took over these institutions. They, everybody had the presumption that there is a God and the, they set up the scientific method based upon that fact. Charles Darwin said there is an undirected, unguided process that can produce the appearance of design. Well, really, is there? Has that been proven? Back in his day, they thought uh, a cell was a simple thing, just a blob of protoplasm is all there was, and a very simple thing to go from that to something else. And We know a whole lot more now about how 
intricately designed the most basic cell is, far beyond our comprehension, all the things that go on in a cell that he didn't know anything about. Would he have still thought that there was just an appearance of design and not real design if he knew what we knew today? So let's uh, look at uh, what the design argument is about. A designer reveals, a design reveals a designer. This is what's been used since the times of the Bible, and it's still a very effective argument to this day. It attributes all the attributes of the designer and so on. A lot of them can be revealed when you look at the design of what that person designed, whether it's an automobile, automobile or a house or a system of government or whatever, all kinds of things that you can learn about that intelligent person that must have uh, created this thing. And we learn a lot about God from the book of nature all around us. Intricate design of an aircraft shows the skill, the care, just how smart and uh, talented the persons were that put that plane together and drew it all up and came up with that design for it. All of nature points to our great God in heaven. Intricate design of creation shows the skill and care of God. Listen to the Apostle Paul. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. He says there's design everywhere that shows there's a God and that there was a designer that put all of this order here. And we see it all around us to the tiniest of things, to the largest of things. In Hebrews 3, 4, For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. In Isaiah 45, 18, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. He, he, he made this universe and this earth so it could support life. He had a purpose behind it. And this is the only place we've ever found any life is on this earth. He made it to have life and to support life. He made it with a goal in mind. I am the Lord and there is none else. Listen to what these early scientists believed and what they studied in their Bibles about the world. Who does great things unfathomable and wondrous works without number? These men were motivated. Let's look into all of those wondrous works and figure out how God made things and what they do. God thunders with His voice, it says in Job 37, 5, uh, wondrously, doing great things which we cannot comprehend, and it's still true. <laughs> the more we learn, the more we find out we don't understand about a cell or about the function of different parts of our body or about the universe. And the more you learn, the more questions there are because of the great mind that created this world. In John 33, or Jer Jeremiah 33, in verse 25, Thus says the Lord, if my covenant for day and night stand not, well, he's making an argument that I've made a covenant. It, it's natural laws that I put in place that cause the sun to rise and set and cause all of the different things that happen in nature. I'm the lawgiver. I'm the one that appointed these things. We're told in the book of Psalms that the book of God is, of course, one way that we uh, hear about God and His will and understand our duties. But we also have a book of nature that God has left His designs behind that proclaim His glory. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the works of His hands. Day to day pour forth speech, and night to night reveal knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterance to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. It rises, rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is none hidden from his heat. So he says there's a voice, there's a message shouting at you up there with those stars and in all the things that God has made, that God is great, that He is glorious. And look at His wisdom and power that's displayed all around you in the things that He has made so that we can read that book and understand things about God. Uh, Joseph uh, Needham uh, is a doctor at Cambridge University. He wrote a history of science. And he talks about in that how a uh, belief in the Bible and the God of the Bible is what led to the scientific revolution and all of the 
uh, rules that uh, uh, caused the rise of modern science, all this idea of investigating things. It's a critical, critical in its contribution to the rise of modern science, he says. It fueled the scientific revolution. A change in thinking was necessary for the scientific revolution to happen. And the Bible is what laid the background for that. Uh, there must be some X factor he talks about in the book that could explain the scientific revelation in the 1500s and through the 1700s when they discovered all of these basic laws of chemistry and physics and so on. Well, what was that X factor? It was believing in an all-wise God. It was believing in a, a God of order and logic and that he made all of these things in a logical, understandable way. And if we'll go out and investigate and experiment and so on, we can find out what all the rules are and how it works. It didn't happen in uh, China. They had a big civilization there. They invented gunpowder and block printing and things, but they didn't come up with the scientific method. That happened where the Bibles had its influence. The Greeks, they had a lot of great philosophers, but they just tried to sit around and reason the way they think it should be if they were doing it and so on, And rather than let's go investigate and see how God actually did it. That's what you have with the scientific method. The Romans built their aqueducts, but none of these sophisticated cultures developed a systematic study of nature that those that believe in the God of the Bible had. They believed that uh, nature is intelligible because God is wise and intelligible, and he, they knew that if they could study it and do experiments, they could find out how things work. Produced by an intelligent mind, therefore endowed with rationality, has order, processes and design, and we can understand it if we'll just study it. They believe there was order in nature because of what the Bible teaches. It's a product of the divine mind, and God constantly upholds it with His laws and sustains it with orderly processes. So we can study and find out what those processes are. That's what led to the scientific revolution. There is a contingency of nature. Nature came about by the deliberate choice of God. We need to figure out what those choices that God made were. God could have made the creation different ways than what we think. His thoughts are higher than I, our thoughts and His ways higher than ours. And so we need to figure out how God did it and not how we reason it out it should have been done or we think it would have been done. And that's how they set out testing everything. That's part of science is to test all of your conclusions. Have other people test them and find out if they're true. It's not this, it's only materialistic and you can't question it. That's not science. That's not how it all started. <laughs> it all started with, there's an orderly system here, let's find out how God did it. That's how they started all of these different fields and found these laws. Well, you've got to investigate. Sinners are prone, and people that believe the Bible know this is true, to being biased. Right? So we've got to check each other. We've got to keep studying and and not just take our own word for it or our own thought for it. It's got to be proven. That's the scientific method. They use three metaphors in these early science books that laid the foundation for all the discoveries. They all talk about a book of nature, the clockwork of nature. They talked about the laws of nature. And even though they want to say it's some mindless chance that guides everything, don't we still have that kind of language when we talk about science? I'm sure they'd like to purge that out. They don't want us to talk about that anymore. But that's the way it all started. The book of nature is the way the scientists would describe or what God's attributes revealed in the creation around us, just like Psalms 19 talked about. The study of nature, they thought, was an act of piety to be a scientist. You were following the footprints of God and His thoughts when you studied science. See how they've corrupted science? in these last uh, century or so. God designed to have uh, all of these works made so people would regard what God did, glorify Him, take notice of what He did, is what Boyles uh, said. He's the one that came up with all the laws of gas and pressure and all of that that we all use all the time. A clockwork nature. They said nature is a machine. It's been crafted intelligibly. It's like you go out and find as a uh, Paley said in one of his evidence books in the 1700s, if you went out into the woods and you found a watch and you looked at that, you, it wouldn't take you long to figure out this isn't natural. It didn't get here by chance. 
This thing was designed by an intelligent mind that put this watch together with all this intricate design to it, right? So they looked at nature in that way. It has regularity. That's like his gas laws and pressure and volume and temperature and all of that and all the formulas, simple formulas in math that you can use to explain it because God is a logical God. And God created the whole engine. He had to put all the parts together to get this world to function as it is so there'd be life here. Isn't that what Isaiah said he did? We could live here. It wasn't just uh, ad hoc, step-by-step -step chance. He had a purpose in mind when he created the world. The laws of nature, we read about those in Jeremiah 33, his covenant that he sets, the boundaries of the sea and all these different things. There's an orderly governance that these scientists recognized. Newton is one of the greatest minds and scientists that there's ever lived that came up with all of the, you know, how the elliptical orbits and so on happen and the laws of physics invented calculus that everybody uses all of these math for motion and all of that. That was, this guy came up with that. And what did he say? Though these bodies, when you're talking about the planets and so on, may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, yet they could by no means have first derived the regular position of the orbits themselves from those laws. Says somebody started this. Somebody put these planets and spun them up in the way that they're spun up. That's why these galaxies are all rotating the way they are. God did that. There's something out there besides just nature. Thus, this most beautiful system of sun and planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. That's what Newton understood. He's smarter than these guys writing these books around today, I can tell you. And uh, Newton believed that the lawful regularity that he described with mathematics were a product of God's constant spirit action. He believed the world was upheld by God. Now that's what he wrote at the end of his great book on, on physics. And it, he certainly didn't see any conflict between science and religion, but that wasn't there. Well, let's look at a few examples in a little bit of time we got here of irreducible complexity as a powerful argument for creation and design, a structure or mechanism that requires several precise parts to be assembled simultaneously for there to be a useful function for that structure or mechanism. I saw one man with a, with a, uh, he had a, a mouse trap. And you gotta have all the parts of that mouse trap together or it won't catch a mouse, right? You can't have just the part that you bend back or just the piece of wood. You gotta have the, you know, the trigger and you gotta have all the parts there. If they're not there, it won't do anything useful. And how many parts of your body and in creation, you gotta have all the parts there all together at the same time. You can't just make a little piece at a time and have it work. You gotta have it all together for it to work. That's this irreducible complexity. And you can't explain these things in our body and so on just by, well, you just needed this little bit of change to survive. No, you need the whole package in order for it to work. Not just one little piece of it's got to change. The whole thing's got to change. Evolution has no ability to bring about the many precise design changes that are necessary to make the leap from one design concept to another. I heard a guy one time talking about the difference they talk about our kids about. Well, you got this cow or whatever, and he turned into a whale. Do you know the differences in a cow and a whale? Think about all the different things that have you have to change that cow in order to make. And they act like, oh yeah, it just happened. It just happened. Just a little bit here, a little bit there, and it happened. Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find uh, out no such case. Well, you didn't look long enough or deep enough because they're all around us. Things with all the parts have to work the way they're supposed to or it won't work. Like I say, he didn't understand at all about the cell and all of the things that go on inside your cells. Well, you got the DNA in there, and you got a certain little engines that come along and strip the DNA apart, and then it copies it, and it sends it over to the nucleus, and it does something to it. Another little machine carries it over somewhere else. 
it's more complex than any jet you see out here at the airport taking off. Just one cell has all that going on in it that we don't uh, yet fathom. This uh, bacterial flagellum, they are little engines that are inside some of these one cell bacteria that turn at a thousand RPM to spin them through the water and get them where they're going. That didn't happen by just some little bitty change happening to get that design. Your eye, if you break down all the parts of your eye or the human knee, knee joint or uh, the upright uh, structure that we have in our body so we can walk around and do the things we do. They're just looking at the cell. Trillions of cells are in your body. Three billion instructions are designed to make each cell operate and do what it does. The complexity of the cell, it has little molecular machines that are working there. There's walking motors, protein motors, just on and on and on. There's whole films that you can get online at different creation uh, websites and so on, and you can see it all illustrated the things that go on inside the cell that show this complexity. It uh, is able to take 20 amino acids, and it has instruction in your cell to take those and build proteins. And they have to be proteins that are lined up with the atoms just in the right order, sometimes 300 in a row to make it do a certain thing in your body or make a certain part of your body. Turns them into enzymes. They've got to be folded over just right so they lock into another enzyme as you're building an organ in the body or the body itself. The DNA is what is the computer code that tells the body how to construct all of these different enzymes and proteins that make you up. And that just accidentally happened. There's complexity there. Four nucleotides is the little code that's written there. We have zeros and ones in our computer code. God's got four parts to his computer code that is written in every living thing on earth that tells it how to build that particular creature. You think that's not design? That there's not a designer behind things that's glorious and powerful? Build those 20 amino acids. From that, you can build 100,000 different proteins that it tells it to build. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, Paul says to Timothy. God's the one that did that. And he needs to be glorified. The DNA code, the design that is there. If you've got a code that is written, an intelligible code, isn't that what they're looking for with their big telescopes, wanting to hear some kind of signal out there that's got a pattern to it that shows intelligence so they could recognize there's aliens out there somewhere and they never can find it. But we look inside a cell and there's a code. And it's intelligible. It tells you to do certain things. It, it tells these different uh, enzymes to be built and so on. Where does that information come from? The only place information comes from is from a mind. So what existed in the beginning? Matter only or a mind? God, a mind existed in the beginning. He put that information into those cells. And you can't get more complex one generation to the another. You just lose a little bit of it one generation to another. You don't get more information. It was all put there in the beginning. How do you get from molecule to digital information from blind, undirected material processes that they're telling our students that's all there is? You, you can't get there. That doesn't get there. We know where these computer codes come from. Uh, Bill Gates, he got, did all that work to make Microsoft and all of that. He said the DNA is a computer code that is vastly superior to anything we've got. Now that's what he says about it. If you see a computer code, do you think there's somebody wrote the code? If you see DNA, don't you understand somebody had to write that information in there for it to work? There has to be a God that's controlling all of these little engines inside the cell and uh, that builds this life. Information points to a designing intelligence for the original life. And that designer is God. And the Bible reveals him to us. So you want to see a signature where God signs something? Look at the DNA. That's the signature of God in every one of us, that he is our creator. Specified complexity. You randomly change the code, you destroy the code. Isn't that what happened to a computer code? You go, I just want to go in here and like move this around 
and then the program doesn't work, right? You've got to have it laid out just the way it is. If you start monkeying around with it, it won't work. In the same way with this information in ourselves. Irreducible uh, human arch in our foot. I mean, <laughs> there are so many. I mean, we could, we literally could go on on every part of your body. But do you know you have an arch in your foot that makes it possible for you to walk? And an arch is a very specifically designed thing. The Romans came up with it. You got that keystone in the middle you slam in there and you can support a big bridge or whatever with an arch and, arch, and they, they put them all over. Well, God built one in your foot and it has the bone shaped in a specific way where they you put pressure on your foot, it supports your foot. You're able to balance on your heel and toe and be able to walk upright. You say, oh, we came from monkeys. Well, monkeys don't have that. Apes don't have that. They've got a flat foot. they got a hand on their foot, really. And there's not a way to go from that to your foot. They haven't ever found an animal out there anywhere in all the fossil record that's somewhere between the foot of an ape and the foot of a human being because God specifically designed it with all of that complexity. It all works together to make the foot that you've got. And it's just one example of many that could be given about these things. I say there's no transitional forms that prove that. Stephen Jay Gould was the head at Harvard, I think, in their uh, in evolution department or whatever, and he said the fossil evidence supports the creation of the earth. He said they had to come up with some other idea because the fossil record doesn't prove it. Those intermediate forms are not out there in that fossil record. Common design is one thing that you can look at. It, that some uh, great designer, if he's got something that really works in one area to make one machine, doesn't he use it with a lot of different ones? You come up with a design for an eye and how an eye can work, why well, you can use that in a reptile if you're a designer, <laughs> or a bird, or a fish. You could use it in all these different things. Isn't that what designers do? They come up with a good idea for a suspension system for a car. They use it in a whole line of cars, right? They don't just use it in one of them. And God does the same thing. It's not an evidence of common heredity or whatever. It's a common designer that put these things together. And we see many examples. We went to the bone museum recently with our grandchildren. And all those bones of these different animals, there's a lot of common design used in those bones from one animal to another that God has used. Uh, you take the eye, it's got a common design uh, that uh, it have a light sensitive cells and nerve pathways that signal the brain. And again, you got to have the thing to receive the signal in the brain and all of this eye stuff all at the same time or it won't work, right? All the different parts of the eye have to be there or it won't work. There's irreducible complexity. God is the one that made the seeing eye. I'll just throw one more out here. I'll quit. <laughs> Over design. Have you ever thought about that? If evolution is just the survival of the fittest and the, every little change is just so you can you can survive. How come we're so over-designed? Now, Elon Musk, he's designing a pickup truck, right? And he was driving, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Used to be on The Tonight Show. Uh, driving him around in this new, new pickup truck. And he says it is uh, bulletproof. He says, well, why do you make it bulletproof? Well, it's cool, you know? I mean, I mean wouldn't you rather have a bulletproof truck and one that's not, right? He over-designed it. Make it cool so people want it. It can do all these different things that a regular pickup truck can't do. Well, that's the way God is when he made us. He over-designed us. He over-designed our hands and what our hands can do than just be able to get out here and grub around in the dirt or get some vegetables off a tree or whatever or a fruit. No, we can write symphonies, we can write books, we can do all of these different skilled, different kinds of crafts and things. God over-designed us. Doesn't that show a designer is behind these things? Well, I don't want to uh, speak longer than your seats can bear. I'll stop there. But think about these things and think about the glory of our God and just how many different things are being ignored. The over-design over, over there is all our facial expressions. 10,000 different ones so we can communicate our feelings. We, you get these little babies, they're just a few days old, and they already smile at you, right? Why did God design that in? That, is that necessary for survival? Yeah, just survival of the fittest? 
that we have all of these expressions on our face. No, God made it because we're in His image. If you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to encourage you to do so. We've had songs about following Jesus. Well, Jesus did the righteous will of God. It was God's will that He be baptized even though He had no sin. And His will for all of us is that we be baptized to do God's will for the forgiveness of our sins. If you've not obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you to do so. If you need the prayers of the church, they're also extended to you as together we stand and sing.